My name is Professor Alex Jones. I am a plant scientist at the University of Warwick. So I have two main areas of research. I look at the plant's innate immune system. So this is how plants perceive pathogens. So like bacteria, they perceive little parts of the flagellin tail or chitin from insects and fungus. And then that triggers defense signaling within the cell. So I look at how proteins convey and process information to mount a defense response. Uh, that's been most of my career. And then my second research thread is looking at how roots grow in response to phosphate starvation. So phosphate, of course, is a key component of fertilizers, NPK, and uh, plants change dramatically how their root architecture is shaped in response to phosphate starvation. And I know it sounds like those are two separate areas, but both involve perceiving signals from outside the plant and then reshaping how the plant grows, in one case to thicken cell walls to fight off pathogens, and in the other case to reshape the roots to grow and scavenge phosphate. Plants have a few basic inbuilt um, areas of defense anyway, such as their cuticle or closing the stomata, which is where air gets into the cell, but also bacteria and fungi can enter the leaf through stomata. But after that, plants have an innate immune system, which is actually in some ways parallel to an animal innate immune system too. So it's inbuilt inside every cell. There are receptors that hang outside the cell waiting just to see if there is a bacteria out there. And when a bacteria, a bit of flagellin, something like that, triggers the receptor outside the cell, it changes its shape. And on the inside of the cell is the other half of the protein. And that is an enzyme called a kinase, which will transfer a phosphate to other proteins and propagate the alarm signal. So these receptor kinases are like a fire alarm that sense change and uh, have this. So that's the innate immune system. Animals, of course, have an adaptive immune system, uh, which plants do not have at all. So plants have expanded and elaborated on this system hugely. There are nearly a thousand receptor kinases in plant cells that respond to hormones, pressure, um, as well as um, external signals, um, such as hormones, as well as these bacteria or chitin and stuff like that. Plants need to take up phosphate from the soil, but phosphate is quite tricky because it's not immediately available to the plants. It tends to get locked up in inorganic salts or in organic materials such as phytate, which other organisms produce. So phosphate is often present in the soil, but it's not available to the plant that only likes it in one particular form. So when a plant senses that there's not enough phosphate nearby, a signal, oddly enough, moves from the roots to the leaves. Processing happens and then the signal comes back down to the root and then the root changes how it grows. And the plant will also increase its secretions into the soil. So it will secrete sugars, carboxylic acids to help also enhance the microbial population that is around the roots. It's a bit like an inverted gut. So you know how your gut microbiota changes depending on your diet. Maybe you get indigestion after an unusual meal, something like that. The roots too try to encourage a healthy root microbiome. And these bacteria can secrete phosphatases that help liberate phosphate from the soil. The plant also secretes enzymes itself into the soil that can activate, that can uh, degrade these phosphate compounds to liberate phosphate to be taken up by the roots. Phosphate is so essential for cells. It's used not only in the energy system or the signaling system, it's obviously a key component of ATP, which we know is part of all energy production in the cell. It's used in lipid membranes, phospholipids. It's a structural component of DNA and RNA as well. It's one of the most essential elements for life. And funnily enough, it's also why arsenic is so toxic because chemically arsenic is a little bit like phosphate. And if arsenic is present in groundwater, as it is in some areas of Bangladesh, for example, the plant mistakenly takes it up, starts incorporating arsenic where it should have phosphorus, and then the chemistry doesn't work out quite so well and you end up with poisoning. 
So that's, a, yeah, a little bit of an aside, but that's why phosphate is just an essential element on all aspects of biology. It's like a backbone compound. And then it is also used in signaling, but that's a bit of an aside. It's one of those funny areas where my research changed direction, actually. So for me, the connection was initially in these receptor kinases. And I became very interested in one receptor kinase called Feronia, named after the goddess of fertility which I think is very much involved with how shell cells define their shape and define position. So that is an overlap between immune responses, because it's slightly involved in that, and also in root architecture. But then, because I collaborated with a microbe group and I found out much more about liberating phosphate from the soil, I actually switched, and now my first focus is more on looking at secreted proteins in the root of what comes out of the plants to help enable this inverted guts that I mentioned. So the projects have become more separate from this overlap with Feronia, which is a very core receptor kinase in plant growth. So I started off doing chemistry and biochemistry at Imperial College as a joint honours degree. Um, and I really, actually I was kind of interested much more in chemistry and toyed with the idea of being a chemical engineer and then really fell in love with complex chemistry, um, particularly metabolism and drug action. And there was very little plant science content in my undergraduate degree. So when I finished my BSc, I started looking for jobs and found myself really qualified to be a technician, more in a diabetes lab or animal research labs. And whilst I, that's important and I support animal research, it wasn't a path for me. So I actually took a year out, I temped and I had a good time in London and I also thought about what I wanted and then I discovered that there was a master's opportunity for plant science at Y College in Kent and I moved there and had a one year plant science um, MSc and that really changed my life. That was a real turning point for me because I hadn't realised that plant science was possible as a career. And Y was quite a small college, so I got to meet a lot of um, professors one-to-one, -one. It demystified the process, worked quite closely with PhD uh, students. So I stayed on there and did my PhD, actually still on metabolites. So I did my PhD on um, mustard compounds called glucosinolates, which give the nice piquant flavour to mustard and horseradish. They evolved as defence compounds in plants. And I was looking at the interaction with aphids. Um, and I, for my PhD, isolated a single enzyme from the cabbage aphid, that is key to how the cabbage aphid actually sequesters and uses these mustard oils in its own defense. Uh, so it's taken from the plants. Uh, so I characterized one protein for my PhD. And that was me sort of sorted there. Um, and then after my PhD, I had a rare opportunity to get a permanent postdoc position. So I went to the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology um, over in Dorset, this was in Winfrith, um, evaluating the risk of transgene escape in brassica crops. So I moved to doing population genetics in wild brassicas, uh, which was a lot of fun. For my first postdoc position, I was welcomed with a big red truck and the keys and sent off to the cliffs of Dorset to go and collect wild cabbages. Um, but it was a time of great dispute because the UK at around 99, 2000 was really very strongly anti-GM. And I ended up also going to more conferences um, in the European Commission, joining stakeholder meetings, which was also a fantastic opportunity. But I didn't like the intense pressure there and for personal reasons. So I actually left my permanent position after just a couple of years and went back into academia to do a postdoc. And that's where I really ended up working on the plant immune system and proteomics. And so another small switch, I stopped using mass spectrometry to identify metabolites and started using mass spectrometry to identify proteins. And that's what led um, to them, which has become the core part of my career. So after Postdoc number two, then, the one that switched me to proteomics, I then had the opportunity to join the Sainsbury Laboratory. And they were looking for somebody who could bring expertise in mass spectrometry and proteomics to the Sainsbury Laboratory. So I was there for eight years um, as their head of proteomics, working with uh, many groups across the Sainsbury Laboratory and again, 
mostly in plant pathology, before leaving to the University of Warwick in 2013 to start my own research group. So I have been at Warwick for 10 years now and I have my own research group and now it's developed into these two areas. So initially receptor kinase signaling and now more into secreted proteins and roots. I've really enjoyed traveling around, experiencing different areas of science and it has ended up building into a really nice network. And I remember being frustrated when I was a young PhD student that I didn't immediately have a network myself. And I was quite envious of when I went to a conference and my professor seemed to know everybody and I didn't. But now as the years go by, I suddenly realized that yes, I can go to a conference and I will know a couple of hundred people because I've been in the area for so long and you end up, it does end up being a big family across all areas of plant science. We're not that many. And so you end up with international friends who you see just every four years, five years at a conference, maybe exchange a few emails and your network really builds up like that. And it's really wonderful to realize that I've, I know some people now for 25, 30 years uh, in the area. There's many good bits about my job, actually. I love the freedom now that I have my own group, that I can literally research anything that I like. Of course, with the caveat that it needs funding. So I have a small amount of core funding that I could experiment on anything. But as long as you can get funding, I can change my direction. So that freedom's great. But also interacting with students is so satisfying. And I think it's a nice balance to pure research because there's a magical moment in research where you know something and nobody else knows it. And for just a little moment, you have a secret fact that you then have to painstakingly pr prove and publish. And that takes years and it's quite a slow reward cycle. But when you teach a student something, their face lights up or they come to you afterwards and you do the marking and you saw that they did well. So it's a short reward cycle to teaching students and interacting with them. And I think it actually gives a nice balance with the slower reward cycle of research that is often very painstaking, very up and down. And sometimes by the time your paper is published, you've lost the buzz that you had at that initial discovery because it was a year ago or so. Whereas with a student, it's really much more dynamic. So I think both aspects work well.